Chem 201, College Chemistry 1, Chapter 6, Thermochemistry. Thermochemistry uh, for most of us, uh, for, <clears throat> for the ones that are going to be doing chemistry for a while, this is really a, a chapter that is part of a, one of the most important fields or areas in chemistry, which is called physical chemistry. For the people doing engineering, you guys will do physical chemistry, definitely thermodynamics. Thermochemistry is just one small chapter of thermodynamics. For the people doing forensic science, you guys will also take physical chemistry. So thermochemistry is, let's say, the, the intro, the intersection of chemistry with physics. Okay? So the same way as biochemistry is intersection between biology and chemistry. Okay? So <clears throat> this is really like the door to the physics area, how it is connected to the, to the chemistry uh, subject. So it, it looks really short, nature of chemistry, enthalpy and calorimetry, Hess's law, and enthalpies of formation, but there is many topics to discuss. Uh, let's see how it goes. I mean, it's a lot of uh, concepts. It's, it's, there is a lot of also problems, practice, but we are really gonna be dealing with theory, uh, concepts, and then definitions. Okay, so let's start by defining energy because that's the subject for this particular chapter. So in this case, energy uh, is a, uh, it is defined as the capacity to do work or to produce heat is the capacity something for example the the, the sun right so because it is transferring uh, the the temperature high temperature to the surroundings that is really not the energy so we call energy the capacity if I have the capacity for example after eating a chocolate bar let's say I'm gonna have I'm gonna be full of energy but if I don't move, if I don't walk, right? So that energy is wasted or, or at least I have it as a storage. So the energy is the capacity. It's just like the ability that I have to do something. If I do it, or if I don't do it, it's up to me. But the fact that I have the capacity, right? Like for example, these people that they have, let's say like 10 books in their shelves. Do they read them all 10 or they just read, or they only read one and then the other nine, they just have it, have it as a decoration, right? So. It is that type of definition. Energy is just the capacity. It, it is a property and ability that a particular system, system we will define it in a really shortly, uh, for example, a person, right? So that it will, it will do the, the work. Uh, <clears throat> here it complements a little bit um, the law. If you recall from stoichiometry, according to the stoichiometry, one of the fundamentals, uh, fundamental law, laws of chemistry, it says that there is a law of conservation of matter. Right, so that, that, that the matter cannot be destroyed, cannot be created, it can only be transformed. Well, in thermochemistry, there is also a similar law, which is called the law of the conservation of energy. Energy can be converted from one to another, but can be neither uh, created or destroyed. So the same, same type of uh, sentence or statement is that the energy cannot be destroyed, cannot be created, it can only be transformed. Okay? And one something very important that is uh, for is the first law of the thermodynamics, uh, really, which is also this particular what they call the law of the conservation of energy, is that the total energy of the universe is constant. Okay, so if the universe was born, let's say like with 10, 10 megacalories of energy, well, those 10 megacalories of energy they are gonna be distributed, they're gonna be transitioning from one type of energy to another type of energy. For example, we know the magnetic energy, the electrical energy, the potential energy, the kinetic energy, so all those energies are gonna be interconverting, but you don't lose the total amount of energy uh, of the universe. So the most important um, types of energy that we know, I mean, I, I mentioned a few, right? uh, I said like magnetic, electric, um, there is a potential, but the most important that I would say are the potential energy and the kinetic energy. Okay? So the, the easiest to, to distinguish is the kinetic energy. As the name says kinetic, is due to motion. So whenever you see that something is moving, so definitely you are in front of kinetic energy. Okay? So something like so a car that is moving down the road, or you have an airplane that is also flying on top of your building, you have a, a, the ferries crossing right from Manhattan to Staten Island. As long as it's in motion, there is a velocity attached to it, then uh, we're in front of kinetic energy. 
Yep. So for potential energy, that's a totally different story. Potential energy is something, as the name says, is potential. So it's really not that you see that the energy is expressed, something that you are holding. So for example, if you have water in a dam, yep, so the water is held through the, let's say, the doors of the dam. What happens if you open the doors of that dam? So obviously the water will start running like crazy down the, right, down the, down downwards, I mean, to the, towards the ocean. So it's a potential energy. Same thing. What happens if I eat, let's say like two cups or, or two scoops of ice cream? Yep. So if I eat two, two scoops of ice cream, it's a lot of calories in it. Calories that will give you energy. So if, can I use that energy for running? Can I use that energy for studying? Can I just use that energy for, let's say like climbing, for do hiking? Yes, definitely. So it's an energy due to the position or composition. Yep. So in the case of the ice cream, it is the composition. So it, it, it contains something that definitely will give me energy. Right? So for example, here is by composition. Also by position, as I was saying in the, in the case of the dam. Right? So you have a marble, let's say like you have a hill right here, right here. And there is a, there is a ball here, a soccer ball. This soccer ball has more, like this one right here. This soccer ball, I'm trying to do the, the lines of the soccer ball. That soccer ball has more kinetic energy than this other ball that is lower. Why? Because if it falls, if, because all is always about if in the case of potential energy. If this ball, right, if this ball falls, definitely it will develop a lot of kinetic energy whereas this one is not going to have that much kinetic energy. Yeah? So remember, potential is really about like what if. It's always a what if attached to the potential energy. Yeah? So here is another comparison for potential energy. I could say that the ball A has more potential energy than ball B. What happens if I let A go? Well, that's initial position, right? So it says here, ball A has a higher potential energy than, than ball B. What happens if I let ball A go, well, that's the final position. So A dropped, it hit the ball B and they make, made it move. So the conclusion is after A has rolled down the hill, a potential energy lost by A has been converted to random motions with the components of the hill, frictional and heating, and increasing the potential energy of B, right? It pushed B because B used to be here. So B got pushed to this final, final position, see? So B had no energy, but it got the energy transfer from, from, from ball A. Uh, why are we talking about this? Well, this, a similar situation is gonna happen for, um, for chemical reactions. Okay? So for example, normally you have two reactants or even in the case of one reactant, there is always energy transfer between the, the reactants of a, right, of a particular reaction. And so one, for example, whenever you have a chemical reaction, as we're gonna be learning later on, or, or we discussed a little bit when we were doing a stoichiometry for chemical types of chemical reactions, uh, a chemical change or chemical reaction, normally you have to break bonds. That breaking, right, that, that bond breaking involves energy. You cannot just break bonds just by putting things apart. You need to carry enough energy to break those bonds. If you don't have enough energy, then the reaction is not gonna occur. Yep. So that, that is the, really the association of the energy. Like, why are we studying energy now, right? If it's, that's physics, no, because chemical reactions, they, are, they, are heav they heavily depend on the amount of energy. If you don't have enough, enough heat or enough energy to break, uh, let's say, like HH hydrogen, hydrogen bond, definitely you cannot make water. Yep. So same thing for oxygen, 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 oxygen bond. You need to break it to make water. Well, you don't have enough energy. Well, you cannot go to the product side. You cannot make water. Here is more about energy, the, uh, heat. Heat is different from energy. Some people, they, they always say like, oh, heat and energy are the same thing. No, actually, there are different terms. As we said before, energy is the capacity, is the ability. For example, if I eat two scoops of ice cream, I have the energy stored in my body. What happens with heat? Heat is not about cap abilities or capacity. Heat is really an expression. I mean, to express it. So for example, if, if, I'm, if I have fever, I say that I have heat. Why? Because I'm transferring my, my energy as a form of heat. So heat is really a form of energy. 
because you are really you are really transmitting or you are transferring energy from one body to another body, right? Or, or, or between two particular objects, or let's say there are two reactants, is the transfer of energy between two objects, right? Due to a temperature difference. Obviously, I'm not gonna be transferring in, uh, heat between two objects that have the same temperature. So something, let's say like a bar of copper that is at 50 Celsius degrees is not going to transfer heat to another bar of copper that is also at 50 Celsius degrees. Yeah? So the transfer, it has to be attached to a temperature difference. And we're gonna be doing some problems about temperature differences, like what would be the equilibrium temperature for a particular process or a reaction. Work, work is also another definition. At least it's not as, uh, as confusing as heat and energy. Work is really a force acting over a distance. So now you have a motion. It has to be a distance involved for work. Okay. Distance is the key part for work is that you make things move. That's what we call work. For example, if I push uh, a block of concrete, right? The block of concrete got moved, so I'm moving it. So I'm applying work to that, right? So, or let's say like I'm walking down the street and then somebody comes a little kid like with, the, with, with, with his bike and then hits me and it makes me fall. So I'm getting, the kid is doing work on me because it made me fall, made me move a distance, right? A particular speed or, or whatever it is, but uh, in a, a different distance, let's say like, like uh, like uh, three feet away or two feet away, right? Maybe fall. Well, let's say uh, that's a different situation, but it has to have a distance involved. In heat, there is no distance. It's just a transfer of heat, so it's a temperature change, right? So I'm initially I'm at 50 Celsius degrees. If I touch a surface that is, that is at 20 Celsius degrees, definitely there's going to be heat transfer, right? So. It has to be a difference in temperature. For work, you don't have to, right? for work, you don't need to have difference in temperature. What if work also have a difference in temperature? Yes, you can also have it, but it's not mandatory. Okay? One case uh, for that is the steam machine. For example, in the, in the 1800s, uh, is the steam um, train, the steam machine was, was like a real boom. Um, that they were working for the industry. They, I don't remember, it was, I think it was the first, first industrial revolution is that the steam machine, that that's how they, they started to make it uh, manufacturers to like mass production of some products was the steam machine. Mm -hmm. So by expanding the steam, right? You had water as a liquid. What happens when you make water boil? Well, water from liquid becomes vapor or steam. So that steam obviously will expand, right? As we saw from chapter five, that, uh, that gas normally occupies larger, larger volumes. So that expansion from liquid to gas causes to apply work to the surroundings. So that work is a distance because you are expanding, let's say like from a two liter container to a 10 liter container, that expansion creates a, a distance. So that's, that's, that's the work production. Energy state function, uh, work and heat are not. Okay? So what does that mean, that, uh, state, state function? State function is like, it's a property that does not depend in any way on the system past or future. Only depends on present state. Okay? So the state function in this case, um, we are, um, we can determine the, a particular state, uh, like for example, Right now, I want to know what is, how much energy, uh, let's say like a granola bar has, right? So in the case of work and heat, um, it's not that. It is, you have to always refer it to a initial and final state, right? So let's read again this state function definition. It's a property, it's a property that does not depend in any way on the systems past or future, okay? So only depends on present state. So that's why for now you will see, for example, delta. Delta is a difference, and normally you apply the delta to delta Q. Change in heat, right? Delta Q, uh, you will see also delta H. Right? I cannot write the deltas because I'm with the mouse. 
later on you will uh, guys learn about delta s which is entropy okay? in this particular chapter you're going to be working with with heat and also with enthalpy okay so what does that mean that delta delta means like final versus initial so the enthalpy at the beginning the enthalpy at the end right so in this case let's say like what is the enthalpy of the products minus the enthalpy of the reactants is really the past and the future uh, the past of the or let's say the past and the present right so it is it is really a difference in in value so in this case energy is a state function so it does is that's not depending any way on the past or future only depends on the present state so that means that energy i can just define it as a single so like this particular uh this particular object has an energy let's say of 10 kilojoules or 10 calories right that's the but in enthalpy you cannot really say that because enthalpy okay, so here in the case of enthalpy you always have to compare what is the final enthalpy what is the initial enthalpy so you always have to consider a process chemical energy is uh now we are going to the chemistry right the chemistry part definitions is that system is the part of the universe on which you wish to focus your, your attention okay so for this okay, i would like to say that for example if i'm doing uh, if I have in a flask, right, a brown bottle flask, I have water, right, liquid water, and I make it boil. Okay? So I'm applying heat, I will have my Bunsen burner. Right? I apply heat, and the heat will make this thing boil, right? I mean the, the water. So for me, I will call this my system. The system is going to be my water in here. And what is this around this? This around is, is going to be anything that is around it. So all this will be the surroundings. So I decide what I want to make my system. So let's say that I have the combustion of methane, CH4 plus oxygen, to produce carbon dioxide and water. Okay? In this case, I need two and two. So in this case, I have my, in this case, my system is going to be the mixture it's a tank and in that tank I'm going to have methane and an oxygen so that's going to be my system what about the rest well the rest I consider this surrounding and the system is whatever happens in here oh but this system is not the same as this system yeah of course not because that is this is the system that I want to focus my study on this one, in this case, this one is going to be my system. The system really changes from whatever you are trying to do. For example, if I want to see like, okay, I have a cube of ice, and I want that cube of ice to melt completely into water, liquid water. This is liquid, this is solid, right? So in that case, I will make this my system, right? All the whole thing, right? That is, is changing from solid to liquid. What happens when the outside? Let's say if I have this thing in a fridge, while the fridge would still be the surrounding. My system is the solid, right? It's the cube of ice, what I'm, what I'm really focusing for my, um, as the system. Okay, the surroundings uh, include everything else in the universe, right? It's, it's the entire universe. It doesn't have to be, as I was saying, like, oh, it's the fridge, or it's the Bunsen burner and the classroom. I mean, it is really the entire universe what is, uh, is going to be can be labeled as the surrounding. More definitions to, to, to for this chapter, as I was saying at the very beginning, we'll have a lot of definitions, is endothermic reaction. An endothermic reaction, an endothermic process, it means that as the name says, endo, right? Endo stands for, it's going in, right? So if something goes in, so for example, if, if I have, Okay. If I have, let's say, like a cube of ice, right? What happens if to the cube of ice, right, I apply heat? Then the ice is going to melt, right? It's going to go to liquid water. So that process of absorbing heat, because this, the cube of ice is absorbing. So anytime it's a process that, that includes the absorption of heat, it's called endothermic. 
That means that the system absorbs energy from the surroundings. Okay, the surroundings are prov is providing the heat for it to melt. What happens in the other case? Now, since there is endothermic, there is also another term which is exothermic. In the case of exothermic, now what we have is that, let's say like I have a bar, right? A bar of iron, that bar of iron is at a 50 Celsius degrees. I put it in a beaker with water. Okay? That beaker with water was initially at 10 Celsius degrees. What happens with the 10 Celsius degrees water? Well, if you put a bar of, of iron that is at 50 degrees, definitely the iron is going to donate the heat right to the water because there is a temperature change. 50 and 100. So who is gaining? Who is gaining the heat? Well, the water. So water would be for water. It would be endothermic because it's gaining the heat. But what happened with iron? Iron is losing heat, right? Because it's going from 50 to another temperature because it's next to something that has 10 Celsius degrees. So because it's losing heat, then this one is undergoing an exothermic process. Okay. That's why it was so important to differentiate between the universe and the system. In this case, to call this process exothermic, I have to label my iron bar, right? In this case, this R as my system. Because my system is losing heat, right? My system is losing heat, 50 Celsius degrees. You put it in a surroundings of 10 Celsius degrees. Definitely it's gonna give off heat. If it gives off heat, it's called an exothermic process. But if somebody loses heat, that also involves that somebody is receiving the heat. In this case, it would be the surrounding, right? But you label a process based on the system. In this case, my system is losing heat, then the process is called exothermic. In the other case, my system is gaining heat. If it's gaining heat, it's endothermic. What happens with the surroundings? Well, the surroundings are giving, giving heat, so they are really being exothermic, right? They are, they are donating heat that would be the surroundings. But in this case, my system is gaining heat. Therefore, the process is endo endothermic, okay? I will have some examples for this type of like definitions for process, different processes that they absorb or they, they emit, right? Or lose, uh, lose heat. So <clears throat> heat, flows, uh, heat flow is into a system, right? So it goes from the surrounding to the system absorbs energy, right? Something that is a process in which absorbs energy from the surroundings. An exothermic reaction is totally the opposite. The energy flows out of the system, right? Like the case of the iron, iron bar, right? That was, is out of the system. My bar of iron was losing heat and the energy is gained by the surroundings, right? So for example, in the, in the case of the ice cube, right? So if you let it melt, the ice cube is gaining heat. But what happens if you put it inside of the fridge? Well, in the case of the fridge, the surrounding is colder than the, than the ice cube. So definitely it's not gonna let it melt. To melt a cube of ice, you need a surrounding that is higher in temperature than the ice cube. If not, it's not going to, it's not going to proceed the, uh, the melting. Okay, is the freezing of water endothermic or exothermic? Explain, right? So let's go now through that process, right? The freezing of water. So I have the puddle of water. Let's say like we are in the middle of the winter time. Let's say sometime in February, middle of mid February, and then it becomes ice. How many of those black ice that are very slippery? Safe. So liquid, right? And then goes to solid. Is the process exothermic or endothermic? Well, in this case, remember that your um, the liquid, right? So it is in the well, the that will be your system. What does it take for for to go from liquid to solid? Well, normally the solid has to be water solid, right? So it has to be at least zero Celsius degrees. In the liquid, let's say room temperature twenty five Celsius degrees. So what happens with the object or my system? My system is losing, right? It's getting a colder, right? It is, it is getting um, um, 
a lower temperature. If it's a lower temperature, then how would you describe this as an exothermic or endothermic? Something that has a lower, lower, um, lower temperature. Where for me to go lower in temperature here, right? That means that the liquid is losing heat. Right? Otherwise, how can you go to zero Celsius degrees if you are not losing heat? So since my system is losing heat, right? I will call this process exothermic, okay? So you can do this type of analysis, like always your initial state and your final state. Remember, heat is, a, is, a, is not a state function. So you have to analyze initial versus final. It's always a process. So liquid to solid. So liquid is at 25 Celsius degrees. How, why do you decide 25? Oh, it doesn't matter. It can be 10, 50, 80, 45, 39, 19 Celsius degrees. But my solid has to be cell zero. Oh, can it be minus 20 Celsius degrees? Yes, can also be minus 20 Celsius degrees. No matter what is the value of the temperature, but you always have to lose heat, right? It goes from higher temperature to lower temperature. If it goes from higher temperature to lower temperature, that means that your, your, your system has to lose heat. If it has to lose heat, that means that this, you are in form of a exothermic process. Okay? So let's double check here. This is an exothermic process as the answer is shown right here, right? The explanation is because your system is losing temperature. I mean, it's, it, the temperature is, is getting reduced. Classify each process as exothermic or endothermic. Explain, uh, explain. The system is underlined in each example. So yeah, that's the good thing is that they are telling you the, the hands, right? Your hand gets cold, right? When you touch the ice. So in that case, uh, my hand is getting colder. It's the same, the same case as the as the, the liquid, right? Turning into ice. My hand is getting cold. That means that my hand is losing heat. Who is, who is absorbing that heat? The ice. But in this case, my hand is the system, right? Because it's a, like the system that is underlined. The system is underlying each example. So if my hand is getting cold, that means that it's, it's losing heat. So in that case, if it's something that is losing heat, that means that it's giving off energy or heat, then it's going to be exothermic. Next, ice gets warmer when you touch it. Well, ice gets warmer. So in that case, you are already saying that the system, which is the ice, is getting towards a higher temperature. If it's going to a higher temperature, the only way how I can get to a higher temperature is by absorbing heat. I cannot get hotter by losing heat. I have to absorb heat. So in this case, this could be endothermic. Third, uh, water boils in a kettle being heated on a stove. Well, just by saying that is that that has to be heated, right? So that is already telling me that uh, it is also endothermic, right? So water boils in a kettle being heated on the stove. So it has to be also endothermic. The water has to boil because it's been heated. So heated, heating means that it's absorbing. Water vapor condenses on a cold pipe. So condensation. Condensation means that this, the gas phase goes to the liquid phase. Gas phase is, uh, I mean, in the case of a steam or water vapor, is in a higher temperature than liquid water. So it's decreasing the temperature. If it's decreasing the temperature, the only way I can do that is by losing heat. If I lose heat, that means I'm from an exothermic process. Okay. Ice cream melts. If ice cream melts, that means they go from solid to liquid. Uh, sorry, uh, yes, from solid to liquid. Something that has lower temperature to higher temperature, that means that that process is endothermic. Right? I would say that my recommendation for this process is that you have to label as exothermic and endothermic. It's just by comparing. Compare what is the initial and the final temperature and see if, if you need to absorb heat or to lose heat to get a better, a better understanding for this type of problem. So, again, so for each of the following, define a system and its surrounding and give the direction of the energy transfer. Methane is burning in a Bunsen burner in a laboratory. Okay, so in this case, I would say that my system is the methane, right? The surroundings could be the laboratory and the direction of the energy transfer. Well, methane is burning. So if it's burning, that means that it's, it's releasing heat, right? It's releasing heat or energy is flowing from the system to the surroundings. 
right? Because that's really how the most of the, I mean, the the machines work, right? Whenever you like motors, motor for 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 cars, you're they're burning fuels, so they are definitely exo exothermic. Water drops uh, sitting on your skin after swimming evaporate. So in that case, well, it would be the water drops would be my uh, my system. The system I'm just going to circle it. The water drops are my system sitting on your skin after swimming. So my body or my skin would be the, the surrounding. And how would that be the the flow? So the, the the heat flow or the energy transfer would be from my the heat flows from my body to the water. So how do I know that? Because the water, water, water drops are absorbing heat. That's why they evaporate. If water drops evaporate, that means that they are taking heat. Who are they taking it from? They're taking it from my body, from my skin. My skin is transferring the energy to the water drops, so the water drops now evaporate, right? Hydrogen gas and oxygen gas react violently to form water. Explain which is lower in energy, a mixture of hydrogen or water. Yeah, here the key word is this, violently. Okay? If a process is violent, that means that it's extremely favorable. Okay? So <clears throat> that's something that I would like to explain to you. So there are a few terms about energy is that, um, for example, if I have a reaction, I think it was hydrogen, right? They were saying the reaction, hydrogen and oxygen, right? React to produce water. They said that this reaction is very violent, right? So what does that mean that the reaction is violent? That means that the reactants, as soon as they touch each other, they will definitely go 100%, and really, not only 100%, but really quickly, it will go to the product side. So in chemical reactions, normally in all chemical reactions, all the chemical reactions, they always strive to the most stable side. Most stable means less reactive. Less reactive means less lowering energy. Okay? Yeah, it, it can be right? it, you can it can be easily understood. Like for example, when you normally you have little kids they have so much energy that they cannot stay in one single place. They have to go run, they have to take breaks, right? So they have to do something. They have to be like drawing, writing, singing, dancing, whatever. So that's what we mean in low energy. So low energy means that, so sorry, in the example of the kids is that you have high energy. What happens? Well, you are very reactive. If it's very reactive, that means that it's unstable. So these three things are kind of like connected, unstable, reactive, high energy. If a process, right, a particular process, like in this case, they tell you hydrogen and water, hydrogen and oxygen convert violently into water, that means that the, the, the reaction will always go to the most stable. So that means that the water is the most stable and this one is unstable. What do you mean by being unstable? Well, I'm not, I'm not like, it's not a really like a day and night uh, thing. It is not like unstable or unstable. So I would say that this side is more stable, right? And this one would be less stable. Remember, it's always in, it's a relationship. It's a comparison. It's really not like a stable and a stable. No, it is, this is more stable than this. That's why the reaction flows this way. What happens if it's the opposite? This one is more stable than this one, right? In that case, the reaction will flow this direction, right? But in this case, if they tell you that hydrogen and oxygen combine and react violently to produce water molecules, right? That means that this side of the reaction is more stable than this. If this one is more stable, that means that the water is less reactive, less reactive than who? Than hydrogen and oxygen, and also water has less energy than hydrogen and oxygen okay so that's what that term that's why it's, it's very important here to know the terms like who what does that mean lowering energy well lowering energy means more stable lowering energy also means less reactive okay? so for example what happened with diamond why diamond is so 
so let's say so expensive because it's highly stable you can have a diamond for centuries for millions of years and then diamond will not will not corrode will not uh degrade okay what happens with a nail of iron well in, in a month it's already rust right i mean what happens with uh with carbon or with charcoal well in a couple of hours it will be like dust right what happened with rocks and with mountains well over the there is an erosion process right so they will definitely get degraded or they will be decomposed with, with our human bodies after a few years will be again mud and, right, and, and and salts right calcium salts sodium salts whatever uh, are the most important salts that are making up our bodies right so that is the the stability so uh diamond definitely it is uh diamond is the um not only diamond but some other compound they have the same property that's why they are very very expensive same thing with gold gold and uh, well silver not much but the gold for example there are no many ways how you can oxidize or corrode gold that's why gold is so expensive as well and because of that yellow color, right? That is really attractive. Okay, so in that case, water, right? Because water is the is low in energy. That is the key word is that is biology. Internal energy. Uh, here for internal energy, in our book, they normally they say internal energy, they describe it as E. Right? But in some other sources, you will see as you. In general, energy is going to be you. So a law of conservation of energy is often called the first law of thermodynamics. Yeah, that's one of the first laws. Next, next course, uh, Chemistry 202, it will be, um, we will have another chapter on, on, on physical chemistry, thermodynamics. You guys will learn the second law. There is three laws of the thermodynamics. So first law, that's the one that we study this semester. And then for Chem 202, you have the second law and also the third law of thermodynamics. And so the first law of thermodynamics is very straightforward. It's just the conservation of energy. That energy cannot be destroyed, cannot be created, right? It can only be transformed. Okay? Internal energy of a system is the sum of the kinetic and potential energies of all the particles in the system. And for that, I need to explain you here with a diagram what it, what it is, right? So let's say that we have a block of, let's say, table salt, right? Sodium and chloride, sodium and chloride, sodium and chloride. Right? Obviously, they are not distributed like that in, in nature, but um, let's say that you have a, a, block, a cube with sodium chloride. So what happens with sodium and chloride, right? So there is some electrostatic forces. So those forces definitely, they will have some energy, right? Remember that uh, opposite poles, they attract, opposite charges that attract, so there will be some energy. What else? From the previous chapters, we know that nucleus, right? Nucleus of atoms, they have protons, and they also have electrons. What happened with these electrons? Well, we only study up to Rutherford, Rutherford theory, right? Which was saying that the atoms was mostly empty. But late next chapter, we will learn the quantum mechanics, the quantum model of the atom. In that model, you will, you guys will learn that the electrons are constantly moving. The electrons are moving constantly. If they are moving. Remember what is the name of the energy from moving objects? Kinetics, right? So kinetical energy. Who is the kinetic energy? Who has the kinetic energy? The electrons. So all these energies, for example, this electron that is moving, this electron that is moving, so that motion of electrons, that is an energy that is stored. I mean, in, the, in your, this sodium will have its own kinetic energy. This chlorine will have every single component of this particular object system will have its kinetic energy. On top of that, we have the charges, right? The attraction of the charges. You will also have repulsion of charges because remember sodium and sodium will also be repelling each other. 
So in some cases it will be attraction, in some cases it will be uh, repulsion. So all these additions and subtraction of energy that is called internal energy. Okay, so it's normally the energy that is intrinsic to the object. So even though the, the, the object is not moving, even though the object is not at the high, right, on top of a high hill, how could I see, for example, is there energy for a human body? For example, I'm, I'm alive, right, oh, obviously. So I'm not doing any action right now. Let's say I'm not moving, but my heart is beating. My liver is still degrading, uh, is metabolizing. Uh, my brain, there are some um, some ions, neurotrans right? neurotransmitters that are, are, are making the connections. I'm not moving right now. I'm not trying to do any motion, but things are happening. So I will call that internal energy. My blood is circulating my veins without me saying anything. Same thing happened with sodium chloride, right? In the case, in this example, sodium chloride, sodium is not telling its electron to move. The electrons are naturally moving. So that creates an energy that is called internal energy. In my case, my blood that is running, uh, that would be my internal energy, right? Those would be like my electrons. Same thing as my, um, my hormones, right? Insulin. Insulin, for example, I don't tell insulin when to, when to be released into my blood, right? To, to speed up the uptake of, of glucose. Right? So it is something natural. So that particular energy that is created inside of a system without interaction with anybody else that is called internal internal energy everybody every system has internal energy inorganic organic plants animals things that are alive things that are like non-living right so everybody has internal energy otherwise we would never exist in the in the world okay why? Because they're all made of atoms. I mean, it depends about what type of atom, but by being made of atoms, definitely you have electrons. Those electrons are moving. Those electrons, definitely those moving electrons, they will create some energy, which is called internal energy. Okay? So the change of internal energy of a system, uh, it can be, in this case, delta E, uh, it can be expressed as the Q plus uh, plus or heat plus work. And so <clears throat> that's how you can change your internal energy. And that's also part of the first law of thermodynamics. So my own body, right? For example, it will change heat to temperature, right? Remember, Q is always a heat, like in sense of difference in temperature plus work. So I'm gonna be working by doing what? By changing my temperature. So anytime, that's why whenever you guys run or whenever a child runs or an animal your dog you always increase your temperature why is that right i mean like if you are running 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 why why do you increase your work i mean your temperature if you are really not interacting with the surrounding in any type of chemical reaction right i mean it is not it is not like i'm leaning on a really hot surface that's why i'm i'm, I'm getting all that heat transfer no it is it is that every type of work that you produce right every work is always going to be connected to the heat. It always will cause that. And then that will be equal to the energy, internal energy of your body. Okay, so the internal energy design reflects the system's point of view. Um, endothermic process, the Q or the heat is positive. Exothermic, the is going to be negative. Okay. Exothermic, negative endothermic positive the heat is always that remember always that sign so what happens in terms of work in terms of work we say that when the system does does the work then the work is negative when the system is doing the work imagine like it is uh exothermic right the work is exothermic let's say that i mean it's really not like the, a good way how to compare it but if a system is doing the work, it's like, it's exo work. Let's say exo work, yeah, because I'm doing the work, right? The system is doing the work on the surroundings, so it's also gonna be negative. If I receive work or somebody's doing work on me, right? So in that case, the work is positive. I'm receiving the work. 
It, so that's another explanation that is more industrial in the more technical part. So in this case, we'll have an uh, example of the pistons, right? So initial state, we have this particular piston and the final state. So there is expansion, the gas expansion. So one formula, I mean, one simple formula, there are many formulas for work, but the one that we're gonna do now is gonna be pressure uh, delta volume. It's a change volume, right? There is a displacement. Remember that by definition, work is a force that acts on a, on a distance. So here you have a force, right? Which is the pressure, right? The, the, the force of the piston, but then the piston is pressing against this particular, let's say that here I have gas, right? Let's say G gas here. And here I also have gas. What happened with that gas? That gas expanded. So it's expanding. That means that it's pushing the piston to another height, right? To another distance. That distance is going to be H, right? Delta H. That's the difference in, in, in distance. So that is going to be my gain in volume. Definitely I'm doing work. Who is doing work on who? Well, in this case, the one that's doing the work is the, is the system. The system is expanding, right? It's not like the piston is really being loose, right? So, well, it depends how you do it. I mean, normally gases, they tend to expand naturally. If you keep the same pressure, right? The same pressure, if the pressure is the same, obviously the work is gonna be done by the, by the, by the system. What happens if my pressure here, right? This pressure is lower than this pressure. Yeah, that's a different situation because now, I'm releasing the pressure, so that means that the surrounding is allowing the, the system to expand. Okay? So pressure, P is the pressure, A, A is the area, right? Delta H is the height, the, the distance, and delta B is, is, the, is the change in volume. Work, let's continue with more definitions for an expanding gas. Delta B is a positive quantity because the volume is increasing, yeah. And delta B has to be opposite sign. Uh, why is that? Because remember, if it's expanding, for ex expanding gas, right? So if the gas is expanding, the work is done from the system to the surrounding. And then as we saw it before in the previous slides, right here, system that does the work on surroundings, the work is negative. So that's why here, when we were doing here, whenever the gas is expanding, the system is doing the work. So that's why we get here the negative sign for, for, the, for the work. To convert between liters, atmospheres, and joules, we use that conversion factor. One liter atmosphere is equal to 101.3 joules. Okay? There will be more conversions. I will do those conversion problems in my solve problems. Please watch those videos as well because those are very important. They, they complete the idea, because here I, I can do problems and I can do, I mean, I do as many problems as I can, but the lecture is not supposed to last more than an hour and 45 minutes. That's why I want to keep it as short as I can. Normally in this type of chapter, for example, since there is it's a lot of definitions, so the best way how to understand it is by basically by, by talking. So this, this lecture might actually be a little bit longer than the, than the ones that are more practical. Exercise, which of the following perform more work? Well, okay, so let's see in this particular case, um, pressure is equal to two atmospheres, and the volume goes from one liter to four liters. And the second case, we have pressure is three atmospheres, and the pressure goes from one liter to three liters. Okay. All right, so in the case for, in the case of one, so work is gonna be, is expanding, right? So from one to four liters. So it's gonna be P minus P delta B. So my pressure is two atmospheres. And the delta B is four minus one. So it's three, two, three, six. Six liters atmosphere. Okay. What about the second one? Also it's negative, why? Because it's expanding, right? It's going from the gas is expanding from one liter to three liters my PV would be equal to three atmospheres pressure. And my here would be two, three minus one, right? Liters. So oh, also six liters atmosphere. 
So which one does more work? No, both of them do the same work. Six liters atmosphere for both cases. So nobody wins. They, they do the same work. Oh, and then it's negative, right? Negative work because the, uh, it is expanding. They perform the same amount of work, right? The answer says right here. Changing enthalpy, uh, state function. Um, <clears throat> so in this case, the state function, it, it means that you are always gonna analyze the differences, right? Because we were saying before, I think the definition was a little bit different, right? But here we, we, we are concerned about the, the initial and the final. So in this case, delta H, right, is a state function. It depends on the final and the right, delta H means that there is an H final minus H initial. That is what delta H means. Right? That means that it's a state function. That it depends, uh, it depends on the, it's a difference, right? Of the, between initial and the final. Okay? More or less for you guys to have an idea for a state function, uh, it means that, for example, if I have a process, right? That over time, right? I have the enthalpy, right? So I will have here, Somebody tells me, what is your enthalpy at 10 minutes? Okay, this one. What is your enthalpy at 50 minutes, right? It's right here. So what is the delta H? Well, the delta H will be this value. Let's say like, um, let's say let, let's say this is 30. Let's say this is 50. Be 30 minus 50, that will be minus 20. Okay. That's what I care about delta H. But what happened in between? In between, I went down, then I went up, and I went down again. Does the enthalpy care about that? What happened in between? No. What the enthalpy only cares about is your initial versus your final state. That's really what it means by a state function. It's like the two things, it's only the initial versus the final. I don't care if the enthalpy maybe went really high here, they went really low here, and then finally went back there. No, it doesn't matter. That is really the idea of a state function is that it doesn't really matter the course of the process. What really care you care about is the initial and the final and the final state. Okay, that's what it means for a state function. Let's go back. By definition, uh, enthalpy is the heat that is absorbed or released at a constant pressure. Okay, very important to remember. So enthalpy is the amount of heat that is absorbed or released in a particular in a given process at a constant temperature, has to be a constant temperature. That is what it means, delta H, H of product, minus H of reactants, exercise. Consider the combustion of propane. Okay, this one is a little bit of stoichiometry. Okay, so stoichiometry, as I told you in chapter three, you will never stop doing stoichiometry after chapter three. So everything is going to be stoichiometry from now on. You will have always quantities. Plus pi oxygen, so I'm gonna write that equation three carbon dioxide plus four waters plus oh, delta H. Kilojoules, right? So assume that all the heat comes from the combustion of propane, calculate the delta H in which five grams of propane, right, is burned. Propane is that C, 3H8 in excess of oxygen. Okay, so at least here they're telling me that is excess of oxygen. I don't have to calculate the, the limiting reagent. Okay, so <clears throat> how do I do a stoichiometry here with uh, thermochemistry? Well, here what you have to do is the first analyze your process. In this case, my process they're telling me that is minus. Remember, if it's minus, the process is exothermic okay keep that in mind minus means exothermic always positive means endothermic if it's exothermic that means that the process the system releases heat right it's losing heat if it's losing heat that means that this amount of energy is going to be produced so that means that i could also write here plus i'm gonna erase this plus two 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 one kilojoules Why, why in the product side? Because it's exothermic. That means that it's being released. What if my enthalpy is positive? That means endothermic. If it's endothermic, then that energy goes here. 
as the reactant. Okay? So I'll make sure I do some examples in the, in the solve problems, right? the videos. So I'll, I'll show you a little bit more. But in this case, I'm putting the energy as a product because, because of the sign. The sign was negative. Negative energy means it's exothermic. If it's exothermic, the energy goes on the, on the product side. What if my process is endothermic? If it's endothermic, then the energy goes on the, on the reactant side. So I will treat the energy as one, another, one more component of my chemical reaction. So, uh, reference, question, right? I'm talking about propane, right? This is propane. So here I have a mass. So this is a mass ratio. So that means that I have to, um, the reaction is already balanced. The heat is never balanced, so don't even try to put some, some, uh, some amount of a coefficient in front. Molar masses, molar masses of propane, 12 times 3 is 36. 36 plus, plus 8, 44. So 44 grams per mole. So that means that here I have 44, right? I have excess of oxygen. They are not asking me about carbon dioxide. They are not asking me about water. 44 grams of propane produce 22, 21 kilojoules. I want to know how much heat is going to be produced by 5. So 44 grams divided by 5 equal to 22... 2241 kilojoules divided by x. Therefore, x is going to be equal to 5 times 2221 divided by 44. So 5 times 2221 divided by 44, 252.39 kilojoules. That will be my final answer. That's the amount of heat that is being released because it's an exothermic process. So five grams will release that amount of energy. Okay? So let's double check, 252. Yeah, right? oh, I forgot the sign, right? Because we said that it's exothermic, so it's gonna be negative. Yeah, I forgot. I forgot that. I forgot this part. Is that here should be minus. Here is also minus, here is also minus. So that's why my energy should be minus. Okay? So just keep the minus because it's exothermic, right? Because it's being released. Um, that's why it has to be kept the minus. Well, in this case, I put the minus. Oh, but why do you put plus here or minus here? Well, it's really to, to complete the idea of exothermic, right? Remember, exothermic means it's being lost. So the enthalpy would be minus because it's still exo, would be exothermic. Okay, let's continue. Calorimetry is the science of measuring heat. That's gonna be a very key part, of, I mean, key topic for, for this particular uh, chapter right now. So we will evaluate here the exchange of heat. So for example, what happens if I mix uh, cold water with hot water? What will be the equilibrium temperature? Or what happens if I put an ice cube in, uh, let's say in hot, boiling hot water? What will be the equilibrium temperature? That's something that you will, you will need. Uh, uh, for that, we need a property that is called uh, a specific heat capacity. So how to bring that up to, I mean, to for an understanding. Uh, for example, have you noticed that metals, normally they conduct the heat faster than plastic, right? Or, or if you have a styrofoam cups, why do they use a styrofoam cups in, you know, in, in coffee shops or or why are those cups so special that they don't really they are really not hot even though the liquid inside is hot but how come when I touch it it's not that hot because they are bad or they are poor heat conductors can I do the same thing in a metal metal cup can I put my boiling hot water no because I'm gonna burn my hands so there are some some um, compounds or some type of objects that they conduct electric, uh, heat pretty efficiently, and there are some other, other materials that they conduct heat really poorly. How can I differentiate that, that capacity, right, of transferring heat, I mean, in a good or a, or a bad manner? That is called a specific heat capacity, okay? So as the, as the definition says, it's the energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. So the more heat I need, to increase my temperature for one degree, I, have a, I should have a higher specific heat capacity. Okay. Here, the only difference is that here is for one gram. 
there's another unit which is called the molar heat capacity. As the name says for molar heat capacity, now it's gonna be in one mole. Here you would have the definition. It's, it's exactly the same thing, but now you are referring to a mole of substance. Here's a mole, here's one gram. Uh, to be honest, which one is more common? Normally it's more common the specific heat capacity because normally we're dealing with mass of substances. Okay. Calorimeter, two reactants at the same temperature are mixed. Right. And the reaction is, is exothermic, right? So it's two reactants at the same temperature are mixed and the resulting solution gets warmer. Is the process is exothermic? Yeah, obviously, right? So if you have two things at the same temperature and the product is warmer, that means the temperature is increasing. That means it's absorbing heat from the surroundings, right? So the, the process is called exothermic. And the exothermic reaction cools the solution. Okay. So that happened with the for the ones that uh, that do sports, what we call the heat, the heat packs and the cold packs. Okay. Have you noticed that there are some plastic bags that you like kind of like crush them and then it gets really hot or it gets really really cold. Same thing happens with the patches. For example, uh, in my case, I have a really stiff uh, neck and shoulder, so sometimes I have these patches. So like heat, uh, right, hot patches. So you have to remove the, the plastic, there's a plastic cover, and then you put it on your skin. And then once you put it on your skin, it really has like a sticker. And then it, 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 it glues on your skin, and then that patch will start releasing heat. It will not release heat while it is attached to the plastic. Why? Because the plastic is a bad heat conductor. But once you remove the plastic, now all that mint, I, would, I guess it's the mint, it's a mint or some other, chemicals that are really, they release heat, they will now, if you put it on your body, obviously it will, it will get hotter because you, our bodies are good heat conductors. Okay? So <clears throat> the same thing happens with your cold packs. For example, I, for example, I play, play sports. In some cases, I, I sprain my ankle. You sprain your ankle, they say, the first thing they tell you is ice it. But normally nobody really carries ice to a tournament or, or any, any gym. So what normally they have, they have these cold packs. They break it, they crush it, they act as ice because they're really cold. So that would be an endothermic reaction because they're absorbing the heat from the surrounding. Okay? The coffee cup a calorimeter, that's one of the experiments. I think we will have that experiment done in the lab. Okay? So we will definitely do the more math on this, on that particular lab. But here what we're trying to do is that the coffee cup calorimeter, right? is that it will, you will use a calorimeter. Calorimeter is no other thing than a container where a thermochemical process is happening. So that's really the definition of a calorimeter. It, it is a beaker, but you don't use a glass beaker. Why? Because glass is a good heat conductor. You don't want to lose your heat to the surroundings. You want to keep the heat inside. For example, here, in this particular experiment, I, let's say I'm, I'm dissolving a salt, right? So. I want to keep all the heat inside of the cup. What am I using? Well, I cannot use a metal cup because the metal cup will conduct electricity to, to the heat to the surrounding. I don't want that. I want to keep all the heat inside so I can measure the temperature accurately. So I cannot use glass. I cannot use uh, metal. Then I use styrofoam. So normally you, you can even put two styrofoam cups so you prevent the escape of heat to the surroundings. Okay? There is a formula for calorimetry, right? So the energy released or the energy that is absorbed is specific heat capacity times mass times change in temperature. Okay. These are the units, joules, Celsius degrees. Normally this, the heat capacity has to be given. The mass you can calculate it or normally it's given and then change in temperature has to be in Celsius degrees. Make sure that it's in Celsius degrees all the time. Okay, so here, 100, 100 grams sample of water, uh, 90 degrees is added to 100 grams sample of water at 10, at 10 also, so 10 degrees. What is the final temperature of the water? Uh, between 50 and 90, at 50 Celsius degrees, between 100 and 50 Celsius degrees. Okay. So this is a very straightforward problem, but I think it's a good example. So we have uh, 100 grams, right, of water at 90 degrees. And I also have 100 grams of water at 10 Celsius degrees. 
I mix them and then I want to know what is the final temperature, right? So I have these two, those, these two uh, right, water samples. So here will be a Q here, Q here. Q of the hot water, Q of the cold water. Who is gonna be losing water? Um, who is gonna be doing the exothermic? This one is gonna be doing the exothermic, right? Because this one is gonna be giving off the, the heat. The heat always flows from hot objects to cold objects. You cannot flow heat from cold to hot, right? No, it doesn't make sense. So this one's gonna be my exothermic. Exothermic means minus Q. So minus Q of the hot water is gonna be equal to the Q of the cold water, okay? By definition, we know that Q is equal to mass times the specific heat, delta T. And I also know that delta T is TF minus TI, right? Right, so minus Q of hot is going to be equal to minus mass. What is the mass of the hot water? 100 grams. What is the specific capacity? Well, the specific capacity didn't tell me, but it's specific capacity of water, right? S of water. Delta T, delta T would be equal to T final. This is exactly what I want to know. What is the final temperature of my mixture? Minus 90, right? My T initial was 90 is equal to the Q of cold. Q of cold would be, this case was minus, this case is gonna be plus. So mass of water is also 100 grams. S of water, right, because it's the same substance. And then TF, TF minus TI, in this case the TI is gonna be 10 degrees. S of water and S of water cancel out, so they didn't really need to give me the S of water, the specific capacity of water. So I will have minus 100 TF minus 90 is going to be equal to 100 TF minus 10. 100 and 100 cancel out. Minus TF plus 90 is equal to TF minus 10. If I move this here, that will be 2 TF will be equal to 100 Celsius degrees. If I solve this, TF is going to be equal to 50 Celsius degrees. Okay? Make sense? Right? So Q of the hot, Q of the cold, always have to compare it, and that's how you get the TF, okay? So once again, I will do way more, I mean, many more of these examples for the problem, the practice problems. In this case, it's exactly 50 Celsius degrees, right? As, as we just did it in the example. Okay, so here, uh, now we have different masses. It's the same procedure, it's only that it will be it will be a uh, different result. So in this case, I think I have more, it should be between 10 and 50. It should be between 10 and 50 because it is the proportion of the cold water, right? And you can see the proportion of the cold water is higher than the proportion of the hot water. So it shouldn't be exactly 50, it should be less than 50. So I would say between 10 and I don't know, 50 Celsius degrees, yeah, exactly. And if you calculate the, the actual temperature the same way as we did it before, you should get 23 Celsius degrees. Okay, you have a styrofoam uh, cup with 50 degrees of water. 50, sorry, 50 grams of water at 10 Celsius degrees. You add 50 grams, a 50 gram iron ball at 90 Celsius degrees to the water. What is the final temperature? I guess that is, that's the question. The final temperature of the water is, okay. And they tell me now the specific capacity of water, which is 4.18 uh, joules per Celsius degrees gram. And the specific capacity of iron is equal to 0 0.45 joules Celsius degrees gram. As you can see, the water has a higher heat capacity than, than iron. That means that iron is a, better, is a better heat conductor. The smaller the specific capacity, the better the conductor is that particular substance. Okay. So let's do this problem quickly. Okay. So I have in a beaker, I have 50 grams of water, that is at 10 Celsius degrees, and here I'm gonna drop this iron ball. This iron ball is made of 50 grams of iron, and it's at 90 Celsius degrees. I want to know what is the equilibrium temperature. I'm using a styrofoam cup. Styrofoam cup means that the heat is not leaving the, right, the container. Right? You have it all sealed. Because if you don't use a, a styrofoam container, the heat will be lost to the surroundings, but you don't want that, right? That's why you use a styrofoam cup. 
So who is getting, who is exothermic? Iron, right? Because iron is a 90 versus water is a 10. So here iron is minus Q of iron. It's gonna be equal to the Q of water, all right? Q of iron would be equal, mass of the iron ball, 50 grams minus, minus 50 grams. A specific heat capacity of iron, 0 0.45 joule Celsius grams. Delta T, TF minus TI, the TI for iron is 90. Equal, uh, uh, mass of water, 50, 50 grams also. Uh, a specific capacity of water, 4.18 joule Celsius grams. And the TF is gonna be TF minus 10 degrees. Right. right, so 50 with 50 cancel out. I will have minus 0 0.45, uh, well, joules, this one they cancel out, the units. 0 0.45 TF minus 90 is gonna be equal to 4.18 TF minus 10. Okay, so minus 0 0.45 TF plus, 90 times 0.45, 40.5 is equal to 4.18 TF um, minus 41.8. If I move this here, 4.18 TF plus 0 0.45 TF will be equal to 40.5 plus 41.8. So, 40.5 plus 41.8, 82.5 here, 82.3 Celsius, right? It's equal to uh, 4.18 plus 0.45, 4.63 TF. Therefore, TF is equal to 17.78 Celsius degrees. Okay, so theoretically that is the final the final temperature of the mixture. So 17.78 Celsius degrees for the mixture of the iron and the water, which makes sense because normally for water it takes way more uh, to to cool. 18 degrees, yeah, which is close to 17.8, right? Which we calculated. Okay, next is the Hess's law. Hess's law, it is, uh, it's not difficult. Well, it's really, I mean, uh, I, I always say that right? <laughs> because I'm the one that is teaching it, but it just needs some practice for the Hess's law. So now we're entering the domain of getting the, the enthalpy for a chemical reaction. So for a chemical reaction, we have two different ways. Right? So for the, like for example, in the previous case, methane plus oxygen, uh, you get uh, carbon dioxide, right? Two waters, right? Two oxygens and water. Remember that here you will have a delta H, the delta H, let's say like minus two, uh, two to one kilojoules. Remember that, right? That we had this particular expression. How can I calculate this? Well, first is by doing calorimetry. So you do the calorimetry experiment. Let's say like you put the methane and the oxygen in a bomb calorimetry, calorimeter. I will explain bomb calorimeters in a practice in practice problems in the solve problem session, right? And with that technique, you can determine what is the delta H. Okay? Now that's one experimental. Definitely, everything has to be done experimentally. Do the experiment. Next is by doing the Hess's law. What is the Hess's law? Well, in the Hess's law, what you do is like. I have this one, right? This reaction. Let's say that I don't know this. Okay, I don't know that value for that enthalpy, but I know the value of enthalpy for other reactions in such a way that these other reactions, which have known enthalpy, if I pair them and match them, I get this 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 particular value. Okay? So. For example, I have maybe by flipping, by turning, multiplying by a particular digit, I can, I can, I can modify those known enthalpies to get this unknown enthalpy. Okay? 
Okay, that's Hessel's law. Using secondary equations to find your unknown equation. And the last one, the one that you're gonna be using a lot is from a standard enthalpy of formation, a standard enthalpy of formation. That's the last one. In that particular case, you will use, I mean, we're gonna discuss it right now, but uh, you will use uh, this particular table. It is in the book, normally it's provided, uh, but you guys have the book anyway. So it is in the book, Appendix 4, it's at the very end of the book. So you will have for every substance, well, not every substance, but here we have a lot, let's say like potassium compounds, silver compounds, sodium compounds, sulfur compounds, titanium tin compounds, right? Xenon, zinc. Here we have nitrogen compounds, right? Nickel compounds. What do you have here? You have the delta H, the enthalpy of formation. In what? I have it in kilojoules per mole. What is this delta G, delta S? Don't worry about this delta G, delta S yet. That is Chem 202. That's, cool. That's the next semester, College Chemistry 2. Here, what you're only gonna be worried about is delta H. Only focus on delta H, delta H. Here also, delta H, delta H. Forget about the delta G and the delta and the S. We're not doing, we're not doing enthalpy, sorry, we're not doing entropy or free energy. That's what they are. Delta G is free energy. And, and S is entropy, which are, uh, that is the second law of the thermodynamics. So we're not doing that yet, okay? So different ways how to calculate the enthalpy of a reaction by experiment using a calorimeter. calorimeter. Hess's law, using secondary equations to find out your, right, your unknown. And the last one is the standard heat of formation. So in the standard heat of formation, what you use is all your elements. You say like, how much energy is in here? How much energy is in here? minus how much energy is here, minus how much energy is here. So it's, it's a difference between the enthalpies of the individual components of your products minus the energy of the individual components of your reactants. That's how you will use the standard heat of formation. But for that, you need to know the standard heat of formation. But you have it in a table, right, which is, is given. So out of the two, which one is easier? Um, well, I would say Hess's law. But do I have all the reactions? No, I mean, you, you depend on secondary reactions, okay? So both of them are very, very simple, but I would say like this one is more fun, the Hess's law. The delta H, it is really, it is that you have to look for the value. In the Hess's law, the values are given to you, okay? All you have to do is just twist it. Okay, so Hess's law, in going from a particular set of reactants to a particular set of products, the change in enthalpy is the same whether the reaction takes place in one step or in a series of steps. Okay, so that's why I was trying to say that I want this reaction can also be carried out into these two steps. Okay, so I want to determine the delta H. Well, here I'm given this delta H, but let's say like I have this delta H, which I know that is 68 kilojoules. In this case, is an endothermic process. And then they tell me, they give me this, these other two reactions. I want to double check that this one is really 68 kilojoules. Well, they gave me these other two reactions. Nitrogen plus oxygen, giving me two nitrogen monoxide. And then a second reaction is two nitrogen monoxide plus oxygen, giving me two nitrogen dioxide. What am I doing here? Well, I will add them up. First, I have to double check that if I add them up, that's the, I get this. So if you do that, the two NOs cancel out. The two oxygens add, right? And that's exactly what I have, right? These two oxygens. That's exactly what I have right here. Nitrogen, I only have one nitrogen, which is good. One nitrogen, one nitrogen. I have two NO2s. That's exactly what I need. So if I add in the reactants and the products, right, I get my target then I should also be able to add the enthalpies. 180 minus 112, and then you also get a 68 kilojoules. Right? So this is really what is, uh, is the Hess's law is about. So adding reactions. But it's always gonna be like that straightforward that I just have to directly add them up? No. In some cases, you have to flip the reaction. Right? So for example, whatever is the reactant and the product, you flip it. So the, the reactant becomes the product and the product becomes the reactant. What would be the effect on the delta H? You just change the sign. 
if I flip it, it will change the sign from minus to plus, for example. Okay. Here's another example. Okay, so ammonia plus half of the nitrogen, giving me three, 1.5 of hydrogen. I have this other, other reaction. And then they tell me, based on these two reactions, calculate the delta H for this reaction. Okay, so first I have to let me write it so I can we can go over this nitrogen ammonia 0 0.5 nitrogen. I'm gonna use decimals because these fractions I don't really like it. Delta H is equal to 46 kilojoules, and the second one is two hydrogens plus oxygens, giving me two waters, uh, delta H minus 484 kilojoules, right? And my target is two nitrogens plus six quarters to produce three oxygens and four ammonias. Okay, good. So I want to do this one. Okay, so this one is the problem. So this is my target, and they gave me this particular equation, right? These two other two secondary equations. So I have to add them or oh, well I have to see if I by adding I can get this one because remember this is my target so definitely I can tell that I need to flip this one how do I know that I have to flip this one because in my target ammonia NH3 is a product and in this reaction NH3 is a reactant so I have to flip it I can't I can't keep the ammonia as a, as a reactant because I want it as a product I don't see ammonia any, anywhere else so this guy has to come here and this guy will come here what would be the penalty or the or the this the the consequence? Well, this is gonna change, right? So if I flip this, this one would be 0 0.5 nitrogen plus 1.5 hydrogen going to ammonia. Delta H now is gonna be minus 46 kilojoules. Okay? I flipped it. I flipped the first one. So this one is gone now. Now I'm, I'm creating this. Okay, so now, do I have nitrogen as a, as a reactant? Let's see. Yes, nitrogen as a reactant, nitrogen as a reactant. Hydrogen as a reactant? Well, hydrogen, I don't have as a reactant. Oh, water. Water is a reactant. Do I have water as reactants here? No, water is here as a product. I want water as a reactant. Okay, so let's also flip this one. Two waters. Right. I'm gonna flip this one as well. Produce two hydrogens and one oxygen. And the delta H here used to be minus 484. Now it's gonna be plus 484 kilojoules. So this equation now is gone. Right. Now I have it fixed, right? So remember, my target was two nitrogens plus six waters to produce three oxygens plus four ammonias. Right. That's my goal. This is my goal. So far, I have it, right? I have nitrogen as a reactant, I have water as a reactant, I have oxygen as a reactant, and I have ammonia, sorry, oxygen as a product, and ammonia as a product. What happened with the hydrogen? Well, the hydrogen, they will cancel out, right? Because I have one each, one in the reactant, one as a product. But now what I have to fix is the coefficients. Here, I need two hydrogens, and I have here, here I have half hydrogen. So what I'm going to do, I'm gonna time it times four. Why times four? Because four times 0 0.5 is equal to two, which is exactly what I want. So I'm gonna time everything by four. If I time everything by four, now this one is going to be two. If I time this by four, this one is going to be six. If I time this by four, this one is gonna be four, right? What happened with the minus 46? Well, the minus 46 also gets signed by four. 46 times four, 184. So this minus one minus 46 is going to be now minus 184, right? Here, um, I need six waters as a re, as a reactant. I only have two, so that means that I have to time this by three, so I can make it match with the six. So I time by three, I will make this one six. If I time this by three. I will make this one six. If I time this by three, I'll make it three. So what happened with the 484? Well, the 484 also gets timed by three. 
1,000 plus 1,452. I times it by three. So now if I add it, I will have six hydrogens, cancel out with six hydrogen. I get two Na N2 plus six waters to produce four ammonias and three oxygens, which is exactly what I, I need, right? That's exactly what I need for my target. So what should I do with this? Just add them up. 1452 minus 184. Uh, Delta H would be plus 1268 kilojoules. That would be my final product for the Hess's law. Okay? So the idea for the Hess's law is really to match uh, values. Okay, so that's how to approach it. They do flipping, they do the timing, they did exactly what we did, times four and times three. And the value, yeah, plus 1268. Don't forget to always add the plus because in these particular problems, uh, it's very easy to lose track of your sign. So 1268 can be understood as plus or minus. So it's better, you're, you're safer by putting the plus or the minus where it belongs. And the last part, I know it's kind of like a long lecture uh, because it is, <clears throat> it is a lot of concepts and definitions. In the standard enthalpy of formation, uh, the symbol is delta HF uh, with a circle. Uh, standard means that it's at room temperature and one atmosphere of pressure. So that is what that little small circle is in here, is a standard. Okay. So delta HF is the enth standard enthalpy of formation is the changing enthalpy that accompanies the, the formation of one more of a compound. So every single compound in nature has an energy that, that, that it costs to the nature to produce it okay? from its elements, right? With all substances in, in the standard state. So that means that if, if they tell you, for example, um, what is the, right, so here have, Nickel chloride, right? Nickel chloride, it was formed from who? It was formed from nickel plus chlorine to produce nickel chloride. The enthalpy of this reaction that is equal to minus 316, that's the enthalpy. So it's the energy, the delta H of, uh, delta H of formation is the enthalpy that is, or the energy that is needed to make that compound from the elements. Nickel is the element and chlorine is the element. And what is the delta H of formation for simple elements? For example, nickel. Nickel cannot be made from anything because it's an element. That's why the delta H is zero. Same thing with nitrogen. Nitrogen gas, that's the nitrogen element. Oh, but this N2 is a molecule. Yes, but it's a molecular element. So N2 also has an enthalpy of zero. So elements, they have always enthalpies of zero. If you go lower here, well here, hydrogen. Hydrogen also has a zero, okay? If we go this side, uh, 10, zero, because it's pure element, pure element. Uranium, here, zero. Sodium, zero, right, right here. Silver, zero. But combined species like silver ion, uh, silver cyanide, silver chloride, silver chromate, silver iodide, oxide, sulfide, even potassium hydroxide, they have the values. Why? Because they are combined substances. So always ignore the delta H of formation for pure substances. They are supposed to be zero, right? Okay, so what do we do with the delta H's? Well, in this uh, the definition, what means the standard? So this is about. For a gas, the pressure has to be one atmosphere of pressure. For a solution, the concentration has to be exactly one molar solution. Pure substance for an element, it exists, right? It, it, we know that it's zero, but for an element, it is one atmosphere of pressure and 25 Celsius degrees, which is, is normally is a standard to say that 25 Celsius degrees is room temperature. I know that normally it's not, but right? at least during the summertime or winter time, it's never gonna be 20, 25 Celsius degrees. Heat deformation is always zero for an element. Okay, so that, that I show you already, right? That 
oxygen, nitrogen, pure hydrogen, pure nitrogen, oxygen, you have a heat of formation of zero. Right, so let's go to the practical way uh, problem solving. Uh, yeah, this one is the equation that we want. Delta H of the enthalpy of the reaction is equal to the sumatorial of all the delta H's of the products minus all the delta H's of the reactants times their number of moles. Don't forget the number of moles. Moles of products, moles of reactants times the delta H. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was saying here that the elements, elements in the standard states, right? Elements that are not combined, the standard is zero. Delta H is zero. Don't forget that. Calculate the delta H for the following reaction. Okay, so let's do that one. Two sodium solid. In this case, it's very important to record the state, okay? Because it's not the same thing water, water liquid than water solid or water gas, okay? So they all have different values. So my recommendation for this particular uh, uh, topic is that to keep track of the, of the states, aqs plus hydrogen gas, okay? Okay, they give me here the delta H, so I, I don't really need to, I don't need to get the, the values from the table. So the delta H's, I will write it somewhere here. Delta H of formation, zero for sodium, of course, because it's not combined. Liquid water is minus 286. I'll show you the other values, so you know how to differentiate between them. Sodium hydroxide aqs minus 470, and hydrogen gas is zero, right? Okay, so let's start sharing so you can see the table. That's the problem. Okay, so they tell me water liquid, right? So what is water? Okay, here. If you look at here, here, see, there is a delta H value for liquid water, and there's another value for water gas. Okay? Even for iodine, there is a value for solid, another value for gas. The zero is for the solid, 62 is for the gas, see? Even for elements, you have to be very careful when, whenever you, yeah, just my recommendation, always, just in case, always consult with your, with your table, okay? In the case of sodium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, what is sodium hydroxide? Sodium, okay, here. Sodium hydroxide solution, here they say, There is a, a, a part that is for solid and another one that is for AQ solution. We're using the 470, which is for AQ for AQ solution. Okay. So okay, so let's go back to the problem. We already explore a little bit the table, how to use it. So according to the to the formula, we have that delta H of the reaction is equal to the sumatorial of the number of moles of the products, delta H of the products minus the sumatorial of the moles of the reactants, delta HF of the reactants, right? Okay, we all agree? Okay, so delta H in this case of the reaction would be equal. How many reactants do I have? I have two, but this one is an elemental, right? So this one is zero. Hydrogen gas is zero, so I don't have to take this into account. Uh, this one has a number, so I have to take that into account. Uh, liquid water, I can take it into account. Sodium solid, according to this, sodium solid is a zero, so I don't have to take this into account. Okay, so sumatorial of the, of the products. My products, I only have one product. So it would be two. Why two? Because it's the number of moles. Remember, moles of the product, delta H of the product. So two sodium hydroxide. What is the delta H of sodium hydroxide? Minus 470. This is for my product, minus the sumatorial of the one for the reactants. I only have water. Oh, what if I have multiple? Well, you just keep adding here. Keep adding, 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 adding. As many you have. You have 10 reactants, oh, sorry, 10 products, put all the 10 products here. If you have three reactants, put the three reactants here. In this particular case, I only have one each. That's why I only put one for each. So here would be two, because I have two waters, times the delta H formation of water, liquid water. 
respect the signs, okay? So whatever value you get here, sign, put that sign here. So delta H of reaction would be equal to, uh, that would be 940, right? 940 minus 940 uh, here, minus and minus plus 286 times two, that is 560, 562, 572, 572, right, I guess. Yes, 572, right? Y plus, because it's minus times minus, right? Minus, minus, plus. So, um, minus 940 plus 572 equal to minus 368 kilojoules. That is the delta H of this particular reaction. All right, so let's see how it turns out to be. Yes, minus 368 kilojoules per mole. All right, so this is, uh, I know it was a long, long chapter. I mean, it was only four sections, but it's really rich in concepts and definitions, more than understanding. The calculations part is also a little bit heavy, not as the stoichiometry, but uh, please uh, watch the videos that I'm gonna be posting on solve problems. Let me know if you guys have any any questions?